back a page to 516 all the way, 516. leads us all the way and anywhere with Jesus we can safely go number 508 anywhere with Jesus 508 
late 1800s, James Black, a Sunday school teacher for the Methodist Church, was uh, headed toward the post office and he took a shortcut through the alley on there and he spotted a little young gal, young lady, <laughs> uh, sweeping the porch out there. And so he asked her, he says, don't you like to go to church? He said, yes, she would love to go to church, but she did not have any church clothes. So he talked with his wife and uh, some women at the uh, church. So they got together some church clothes for her. Bessie was her name. So they gave her the church clothes. She started attending church. She attended church. She attended the youth meetings. They had a, another uh, group called the Epworth League uh, Sunday School. And she was there all the time. Each time there was a roll call, Bessie was there. And the song leader uh, liked to close each meeting with something of interest to the uh, young people, something that would, uh, you know, put something in their heart. Then came the day when Bessie didn't show up the roll call, and Bessie wasn't there. He called again. Bessie still didn't answer. After the service, he went to where she lived. He was afraid that her father, a drunkard, maybe had beaten her so bad that she couldn't attend. But when he got there, he found that she was sick. She was sick with pneumonia. They summoned his own doctor to take care of her, and she was so bad that she just, all help was, did not help any at all. <clears throat> but he couldn't shake off the feeling that there was something he could do. He looked through the hymnals, he wanted a song or something for the service, but he couldn't find anything. And then he got to thinking there's going to be a roll call in heaven. So he sat down and just a few minutes he wrote the song and just a few minutes more and he had the tune of this new, the song that we will be playing or using for our opening song. When the roll is called up yonder will we be there so please turn to number 216 when the roll is called up yonder and please stand
Please be seated. Good morning. I'll be reading from Revelation 19, 11 through four. Now I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eye were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on the white horses. Sometimes if there wasn't pinch hitters, there'd be no hitters. Ethan, we'll have our prayer this morning. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this do day, a uh, wonderful new day of life. Please help us today to learn more about you through all that's spoken today. Please be with our armed forces who are given their lives so that we have the freedom to worship. Please bless everyone here, and thank you that it's Sabbath. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I don't know if any of you know it or not, but today is Armed Forces Day. I scanned the paper this morning. There was nothing in the paper about it. It seems that uh, we do not really recognize our, our armed forces very much anymore. Uh, maybe it'll take another war to get to the point where we would realize that, hey, they do do something. But anyhow, I got to looking around. Uh, everything's on political now, election. Uh, that could go on all day long, but anyhow, there are some laws that are made that are still on the books today uh, in Pennsylvania. It's against the law to sell a bathtub, but it's quite legal to buy one, but it's against the law to sing in it. Uh, in Boston, it gets the law to take a bath on Sunday. You might, must have a, a doctor's prescription to uh, take a bath any other day. In Clinton, Indiana, it's against the law to bathe during the winter. In Portland, or Florida and Portland, Oregon, you must wear a bathing suit or some other clothing while taking a bath. Now these are laws. In Virginia, it's against the law to bathe in your home. Tub must be kept in the yard. In Philadelphia, an ordinance was passed in 1843 that prohibited bathing between November 1st and March the 15th. We hope that uh, some of our new laws and everything will not be quite that bad. Uh, November the 20th in 1861, one of the many Union troops review was held in, uh, during the Civil War in Bailey's Crossroad, Virginia. Abraham Lincoln, his cabinet members and friends and about 25,000 other people attended that. It was quite a impressive service. That night, after the review and everything, going home, it was a long trip for back then. It was, you know, you didn't have the cars and everything. It was a buggy ride. And so to pass the time, the ones in the buggy were just singing songs. And uh, one of them, uh, forget her name now, I'll find it in a minute. Uh, she didn't sleep well that night. And she got up in the middle of the night 
And one of the songs they were singing on the way home uh, was John Brown's Body. Now, that was a uh, militant that had been hanged because of his stand on abolishing the uh, slavery, fight against slavery. Uh, Reverend James Clark, who had accompanied the woman, her husband that day, suggested that she write a song, write something that would be more appropriate for that. She couldn't sleep, so she got up in the middle of the night, she found a stub of a pen, a pencil, and she started writing. And she just, hardly even looking at the words, she kept on writing, they just came to her like that. She wrote this song and everything. Now then, in 1864, President Lincoln attended the uh, second anniversary of a meeting of a Christian commission, a volunteer organization that collected food uh, for wounded soldiers and things. Uh, after many speeches, the singing Methodist chaplain, Charles C. McCabe, told the chilling story of his time in prison in the uh, South, Libby Prison in Richmond, Virginia, and closed by singing the song. He taught this song to the prisoners and everything there. Before he had got all the way through, the congregation was singing with him. He got to the end of it, somebody hollered, sing it again. It was Abraham Lincoln that said that with tears streaming down his eyes, he asked them to sing it again. Everybody joined him then as they sang this hymn, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory. It was going to be by the bake four, but it's by the bake four minus one today. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching truth on. Is marching. Glory, 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 hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. Truth is marching. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him, be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. Truth is marching. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea. With the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us live to make men free. While God is marching. God on. is marching. Glory, glory, glory hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching. Sing it together with us. 
glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. Thank you kindly. As you've noticed, everything today has been with our youth group on there. We do appreciate them helping us out on everything. Uh, someplace along the line, I've received a list of some of the things that I've learned. And one of them is, you cannot make somebody love you. You just have to be lovable. And the rest is up to them. I've learned also, no matter how much I care, some people just don't care back. I take, I've learned that it takes years to build up trust, but only seconds to destroy it. I've learned that it's not what you have in your life, but who you have in your life that counts. I've learned that you can get by on charm for about 15 minutes then you'd better know something. I've learned that you shouldn't compare yourself to those, the, the, to the best of others, but do the best you can do. I've learned that it's not what happens to people that's important, it's what they do about it. I've learned that you can do something in an instant that will give you a heartache for life. I've learned that no matter how thin you slice it, there's still two sides. I've learned that it takes a long time to become the person I want to be. And I've learned that it's a lot easier to react than to think. I've learned that you should always Leave loved ones with kind words. It may be the last time you see them. I've learned that you should keep going even after you think you can't. I've learned that we're responsible for what we do, no matter how we feel. We are in the eighth week of this quarter, I think, and uh, it won't be long until it'll be our 13th quarter. I hope you are planning for that. But today, we have a mission report brought to us by Judy Van Tassel, and it's The Policeman's Dream. This morning I'd like to start out um, with reciting two texts that are special to me and that will apply to this story as well as I feel to our own lives. The first one is found in uh, Jeremiah 33, 3, and it says, Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. The second text I'd like to um, give you is found in Psalms 105, 1 through 3, and it says, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, sing to him, sing psalms to him, talk of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name. Um, the hearts of those who will rejoice who seek him. To me, uh, the way God answers prayer is interesting, fascinating, and most often surprising how he does answer our prayers. And we need to share that with others and with each other. Now I'd like to take you to South Auckland, New Zealand, where our mission uh, story comes from. 
and introduce you to Pastor Norman Herlow, which is the pastor of the um, Papa Toto Community Seventh-day Adventist Church. He and his team are praying for a special ministry to the community. Um, not, not that they don't have ministries going that their members are involved in, but this was something special. Now I would like to take you to the local uh, police station where the officers there are looking for ways to prevent crime from happening for strategies to help this not happen so frequently. They were noticing that um, people were being brought in on misdemeanors and putting in the holding cells for a short time. But then this kept repeating. These same individuals would be coming back again, but the next time they would be coming in in the next few months, it would be on more serious major crimes. And they thought, how can we intercept these people? What can we do to um, prevent this from re reoccurring and happening all the time? So they got to talking amongst themselves and um, trying to figure out ways to intercept these people. The senior sergeant um, had an idea. He says, what if we were to place something in the holding cells that they could read that would be interesting to them, inspiring to them, um, something that would encourage them to give up this life of crime and go to Christ? So thus came, um, the, thus came being the, the magazine called Crime to Christ. And in this magazine would feature stories of well-known individuals who led a life of crime and came to Christ. Now the sergeant knew that they didn't have the human or the financial resources to get this off the ground. So I thought, you know, I'll just try to partner with, see if another church in the area will partner with us to see if we can get somewhere with this project. Well, one night, the sergeant has a dream. And in his dream, he saw a pregnant woman. And above her was written the words, Seventh-day Adventist. He woke immediately and wrote down the words so he wouldn't forget them before he went back to sleep. Well, the next morning he shared his unusual dream and stated that the Seventh-day Adventist Church was going to give birth to this project. Well, one of his officers says, you know, I'm an Adventist and I know just the church that would um, be interested in helping the Seventh-day Adventist uh, Church of Papa, uh, Toto Church that this pastor Norman Herlow uh, was the head of and his team would be happy to help. So he got in contact with this pastor and explained to him his idea for the Crime to Christ magazine. Well, the pastor was um, more than willing to be a part of this. He said, you know, we have members in our church that could do layout, they could do design, um, we could get the contacts from with other churches to gather information for the magazine. But the one big drawback is um, we don't have the finances to help you get this off the ground. But he says, we will continue to pray about this and we'll work together. Well, the next day, a, la a woman comes into the police station and she says, I'd like to speak to the senior sergeant. So when he comes out, she says, um, God sent me here to talk to you. I don't know why, but tell me, what are you doing with the, uh, what are you doing in the community? What are you doing for them? So the sergeant explained to her, he says, well, we have an idea of a magazine that we'd like to place into the cells, into the holding cells. She says, oh, I know why I'm here. I know why I'm supposed to be here to talk to you, um, why God sent me. She said, we would like to donate some money. 
So she said, but let me pray about it, and I need to talk to some people, and I'll get back to you. So in a few days, she did. She came back. In the meantime, the uh, pastor of the Toto, the, the pastor Herlow, um, and the sergeant did pray that God would move the hearts of these people who are going to give. So she comes back and she says, I have good news. I have $10,000 I will donate for this project. And it should be enough to get the first issue of this Crime to Christ magazine out. So they were absolutely delighted. So the, um, the first issue featured three um, famous individuals. One was from um, a famous rugby team in New Zealand. The other one was a man named Amos, who was a founder member of a large gang called the Headhunters. And the other story was about a woman that went from abuse to crime, from abuse and crime to Christ. That was the first issue. And this first issue came out in 20, May of 2015. And when that came out, this same lady came again and she said, you know what, I have more funding for the next issue when it's ready to come out. Well, this is just more than the pastor and the team and the sergeant could have even begun to dream and to imagine. But um, since then, um, other police stations in the country have requested that they have this magazine put into their holding cells for individuals to read that have been brought in. And to date, there have been um, seven baptisms um, directly related to this magazine. So their goal is to hopefully get this nationwide, na to go national, and um, the New Zealand country is very secular for them to partner the governor to partner with a church like this is just unheard of. So the pastor uh, knows that this was a direct result of prayer, and because they didn't, they didn't make up all these contacts. Anyway, he would request that um, we continue praying for this endeavor. You just never know how God is going to lead. So keep praying and keep sharing. Thank you, Judy, for that good report on there. So you can see that our Sabbath school offerings do do some good. And remember, we do have 13th Sabbath coming up in a very short time planned for that. We have three Sabbath school class. There's one in here taught by Daryl Gensler. There's one back through here that is taught by Curtis Miller. There's one across the hall in the library on special topics, and Pat McQueen and Ray Babb uh, lead out in that. You're invited to join a class of your choice. If you see somebody sitting next to you that doesn't seem where to go, just give them an invite to your class. Thank you. Good morning, Sabbath School. <clears throat> I want to thank all of you who have 
responded in terms of my mother's passing last Sabbath. It was one of those things that you never expect, but when it happens, it's like, wow. But it could not have been a better event. So, um, Those details are being worked out yet, so I, I'm only one of many people involved in that decision-making process. Okay, let's begin our lesson by let's having prayer first. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank you that you've given us a Sabbath, and we ask that you'd please get, bless and guide us as we consider this lesson, and may we have a sense of, of uh, purpose in the life that we live and the decisions that we make. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> This is lesson number, I never remember which one it is, eight, thank you. Lesson number eight, and um, it is entitled, Peter and the Rock, and the memory text is <clears throat> taken from Matthew 16, verse 15, and it is as follows, one that we're all familiar with. It says, Jesus is asking a question, he says here, but... But what about you? Who do you say that I am? We have talked in this Sabbath school class on more than one occasion, and we have wrestled with the question as to, so why did Jesus come? What was his objective? What was he here for? Um, and the answer to that question is actually more than one answer. There's not just a single answer to this question. Jesus came to reveal to us what? The kind of God. person God is. Okay, is he somebody who we can trust? Okay. He also came to show us how a citizen of God's kingdom lives their life. But what else did he come to do? Okay, defeat the devil. Oh, I have to give you full credit for that one, Dwayne. <laughs> he came to defeat the devil, and now I'll ask the question again. And what else did he come to do? To provide us with a plan of salvation. No question about it. Um, he came to provide us with a way of being saved from the condition of sin. Uh, maybe a better way of saying it would be he came to save us from ourselves because we, of course, are the, the root of our problem in terms of we make the decisions and we have to suffer the consequences. When Jesus began his ministry, what, how was he introduced to the Jewish nation by John the Baptist? The Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. When John the Baptist made that statement, did that statement have, make any sense to the Jews who heard him say that? Yes or no? Yes and no. <laughs> well, okay, you're being too technical. Uh, did they understand... Uh, Yes. Did, they, did they know what a lamb was? Yes. Okay. Was a lamb part of worship for them? Yes. yes it, was a, it was a central part of the worship experience that they, partook, that they were a part of on almost a daily basis. Every morning and every evening, there was a sacrificial lamb that was offered in the, temp, in the temple. And when they came and they... Uh, came as, a, as, a, as an individual to the temple, they also brought a sacrifice, a lamb, etc., etc., etc. And so when, when John the Baptist said, there's the lamb of God, they had, they had a framework in which to look at Jesus that was very specific. Okay? Now, 
There's all other, I, I know some of the other of you are going to say, oh, yeah, but they didn't really understand. They had really, it, it, it had been perverted and lost, and et cetera, et cetera. But they understood lamb. They understood that it had something to do with sacrifice and plan of salvation, et cetera, et cetera. So Jesus now begins his ministry. He begins his ministry up in um, Galilee. And what does his ministry consist of? Healing. 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 Teaching. Teaching. Feeding the hungry. Feeding the hungry. Yeah, exactly. I mean, many, all kinds of things. He's healing people. He's raising people from the dead. He's, uh, he's uh, touching lepers and healing them. There are many things that Jesus is doing. Yes. What's that? Okay, demonstrating love. Yes, exactly. He was demonstrating, again, all these things that were going on. So, um, and of course, as Jesus did these things, and they're recognized as being not something that just your average Joe is doing, not something that your typical rabbi is doing, it generated a tremendous amount of interest. People came from miles away to see and to hear and to experience what Jesus was doing. But even, even among the disciples, uh, they knew there was something different. They knew there was something different, exactly. Okay. So our lesson then begins with this text, which is in Matthew verse six, or chapter 16, starting with verses 13 through 16. And it reads as follows. When Jesus had come into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do men say that the Son of Man is? When Jesus used the phrase, the Son of Man who was he referring to? The human family. All, I mean, okay, the we're all part of, okay, we're all, okay, fine. But in, in, in here it's called, it, the Son of Man is in capitals. Okay, it's, he's talking about himself. Okay, he has identified himself as the Son of Man. And he asks his disciples a question. He says, who do these people who have been following me say I am. Now, let's stop right there and let's step back a bit here. Caesarea Philippi. Where is Caesarea Philippi? That's north of the Sea of Galilee. Outside of the Jewish nation. Okay, very good. Jesus is not in Galilee. Jesus has left Galilee and he's hiked about 25, 30 miles outside of Galilee to an area that is not even populated by Jewish people. A couple other things that are interesting about Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi was a, an area that had actually been a central area for the worship of Baal in centuries past. And in fact, in Caesarea Philippi area, there are at least 14 known temples to Baal in that area. So it was a what? It was pagan, okay, I'll give you full credit for that, but it was a religious center, okay? In a sense, I put that in quotes, okay? Yeah, okay. The other thing that's interesting about Caesarea Philippi is that in that immediate location, there was a very large hill which had a cave in it. And um, this cave was considered to be the birthplace of the great god Pan, the god of nature. And so you have now another element of re religiosity in this area where Jesus has taken his disciples. 
And last but not least, in the city of Caesarea Philippi, there was a great white marble temple. And it was a temple that had actually been expanded and improved and built upon by Herod the Great, and then in turn had been dedicated to the godhead of Caesar. So, Caesarea Philippi, you have the gods of the Syria, Assyrians, the Baals. You have the Pan god, the Greek gods are represented. And now you have the godhead of the Caesars or the Roman gods, all sort of lumped together here in this area. And Jesus takes his at least 12 disciples, maybe there were more, and he hikes up to this area, away from the crowds of Galilee, away from those who have congregated around for the many different reasons that he, um, for, that, they, that they congregated, and he takes them up to this area, and in a quiet conversation with them, he raises the question. So, Who do men say that the Son of Man is? And the disciples' an answer is very interesting. He says, well, they say, well, some say that you are who? Uh, Elijah, okay, but first of all, they say John the Baptist, okay. John the Baptist has died. Well, yeah, but John the Baptist can be raised from the dead. <laughs> And, and same with John, Elijah. So, so he says, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah. Or, and then just to cover the bases, one of the prophets. What do all of these that they have listed have in common? in terms of their function. Yes. Okay, I have to give you full credit. They are dead, yes. <laughs> okay. They're all prophets, okay. And what did they as prophets do? What was their... Evangelical. They were like Elijah and John the Baptist. They were evangelical in preaching about God. Okay, they were evangelizing, okay. Calling people back to God, okay, I, I'll, I have to give you all a half a point, but no more. They're all, you know, the Elijah message, the, you know, and Jeremiah, you study what Jeremiah, they're pointing forward to Christ. Okay, so they were, we started at the beginning of this lesson, what, it was, what did John the Baptist do? Yeah, pointed he to pointed God. to Jesus and said, yeah. this is the Lamb of God. So all of these men, prophets, while they were evangelizing and, and calling people back to God and repentance, etc., they also were looking forward to and pointing forward to who? The Messiah. The Messiah. Well, one thing, out of all of these people who said who Jesus was, none of them said they thought he was the Messiah. None of them said they thought he was yes, the Messiah. They, it was John the Baptist. They thought he was Elijah. They thought he was some prophet, but he was not the Messiah. In hmm. other words, none of these were in ah. Jesus asked them. Ah, yes, okay. Now I'm following what you're saying. None of them said, I'm the Messiah. Yes. Okay. They recognized that they were pointing forward to a Messiah that was to come. Yes. Oh. Ah, yes, yeah, right. I see what you're saying, yes. So none of them volunteered that, at least initially, all right? In other words, the word in the public mind the word on the about street. Jesus, who he was, nobody thought he was Muslim. Nobody thought, yes, exactly. They all looked back in history and said, oh, this must be Elijah that's come back. Now, this must be Jeremiah, a great prophet from the past. Even a prophet 
a contemporary prophet, John the Baptist, they looked at him and said, oh, it must be John the Baptist. But none of them in the, the public sphere were verbalizing that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. So this sets up the disciples when Jesus turns around and says, now, who do you think I am? And, and I'm going to put the, the, the <laughs> emphasis on your question just a little bit differently. Who do you think I am? Who do you? Forget about what they are saying. Yeah. That's in verse 15. Who do you say who I get? Exactly. And so then Jesus said, and you, yeah. you here, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the anointed one the Son of the living God. Why is that answer on Peter's behalf, on, on, yeah, on, from Peter, why is that answer important? Because that's who he really is. Okay. What did he say? That's because he really is. Okay. Well, let me ask you this question. For whose benefit was this question asked, and for whose benefit is the answer? Well, I think uh, the statement is very succinct. That's why it's important, and that is Peter said very succinctly who Jesus was. Okay, I agree. Who is the factual truth? I, I agree with that. But why did Jesus ask the question, and why was it an important question? Well, I think Jesus is setting them up. Okay. He's setting them up to explain what's going to happen to him because we're now within six months of Jesus' death and no, none of the disciples realize that Jesus is going to die. Okay. And they're all thinking he's getting ready to set up a kingdom on this earth. Okay. This, this idea has to be destroyed out of your mind. Mm. If it doesn't happen, what's going to happen is you're going to crash when Jesus dies and you're going to throw away the whole thing just like what happened to Miller writes when Jesus didn't come on the 22nd of October, 1844. What happened? Everybody disappeared Almost. because nobody was Thank set you. up for <laughs> Yeah. Nobody was set up for the idea that it wasn't going to happen. And when it didn't happen, everybody gave up the faith. It was a remnant. It was important for his followers, his closest groups, to know really what, who he was. So they could continue afterwards to proclaim that message. To recognize who he really is. I'm sorry? To recognize really what who he was. Who oh, really who he was, okay. Yeah. Christ certainly would have known or sensed that they uh, they were thinking he was the Christ. But he needed them to verbalize it and needed it to be a discussion among them, I, I believe. No. He needed to um, put his stamp of, yes, you, you've got it. That's correct. And now that you understand that, let me explain a little more how this is going to all come out. Um, the Lamb of God. Mm -hmm. They were also puzzled that Jesus had let uh, Herod and, and the group kill John the Baptist. Baptist. Yeah. Seen so many miracles, why not save John the Baptist? Yeah. You know, I hadn't thought of it before, but that may be one of the reasons that that John the Baptist actually was allowed to be martyred was so that it would help the disciples when Jesus talked to them about his own role, what was going to happen to him, that they had an example, a current example, that followers of Christ don't always survive. Jesus mm -hmm. hadn't spoken up. They might have doubted that he knew that he was going to die as the Messiah. In other words, when he actually died, then they thought, well, he thought he was going to set up a kingdom himself. <laughs> but it didn't happen. But Jesus yeah. is telling them ahead of time, yeah. this is what's going to happen so that your faith won't be destroyed when it actually happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's, uh, you're all, you all get a full point here. Okay, I'll, I'll give you a full point. Uh, 
Jesus, I believe, was wanting his disciples to begin to actually articulate what I believe had been growing in their minds. They were coming to the opinion, and they had, or they came to the opinion, that Jesus was in fact the Messiah. Okay? The problem was that their what their dream, thank you, their dream as to what that meant was completely in left field. They were looking for a king who would set up a temporal kingdom, who would conquer the Jews, and they would move into administrative positions. What a fantasy. I mean, you stay up at night thinking about things like that. Well, the thing is, if you've ever lived through having your dreams crushed, oh, yeah. I mean, you have some kind of dream that you want to achieve, and it doesn't turn out anything like that. <laughs> yeah. It's destroyed. Yeah. The impact on you is devastating. Huge. Yeah. It's hard to pick up and go yeah. forward after that. Yeah. And you begin to doubt all dreams after that. Yeah. And you begin to see young people who have dreams, and you think... <laughs> How naive can you be? Yes. Yeah. Well, all we have to do is look at in 1844. Yeah. It must have been horrible. Yeah, exactly. Now, you know, Jesus, I believe, <coughs> was, <coughs> he was, he was dealing with his disciples in the moment. He knew that they had to have a huge paradigm shift in terms of how they thought. How, what they anticipated to happen. But at the same time, Jesus also was looking beyond the event of the cross. He knew the cross was going to be devastating for them, but he was looking for in, forward to the establishment of what? The church. the church. That's exactly right. And that church had a job to do. And it was not going to be a job that just simply meant, well, yeah, we, we, we knew him, but didn't work out and Dreams fail and, and, and we're done. It was, they were going to be given a job. Jesus then continues on, verses 17 through 19. Jesus answered Peter, saying, Blessed are you, <clears throat> Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, you're called Rock, but on this rock, and I'm pointing to myself as Jesus, the one speaking here, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. But I, that rock is not capitalized. Doesn't need to be, does it? If it's referring to Jesus, it does. Well, if the, if the uh, Bible translators <clears throat> think it is. Yeah. Yeah. You're correct. It is interesting that Peter's name means rock. Yeah. And he's talking to Peter and right. he says, on this rock right. am I going to build my church. Right. And he's re telling Peter that he is the Messiah. Yeah. This is what's going to happen. So it, it's not a far reach to say that he's talking about Peter when he says this rock instead of Christ. Because when you look at Christ in the Bible and it talks about him being the rock, which he is, it's capitalized. Yeah, I think what's happening here is that what Jesus is saying is, I am the foundation stone. Exactly. And I'm going to take other rocks and build on that foundation stone. And Peter is one of these little rocks. Mm -hmm. Because Peter means little rock. Mm -hmm. Whereas Jesus is the cornerstone. He is the foundation. The and not only that, Peter himself says that. Yes. Jesus is the cornerstone in when he talks about it in Peter. Exactly. In, in the book of Peter. But anyway, and so to me what Jesus is saying is that I am the cornerstone and I am going to take you, Peter, a little rock, and build my church on that cornerstone. Right. And the <clears throat> yes. Uh, notes right here. From the first, Peter had believed Jesus to be the Messiah. Mm -hmm. 
This is from Desire of Ages, page 411 and 412, and it explains it perfectly, where we as Seventh-day Adventists don't have to wonder at all. Okay. The, the other thing that I think in this, in this whole exchange here is, who is driving the exchange? Christ. Christ. Peter is not coming up with this on his own. He's, he's coming up he, because Jesus is asking a question. He is drawing it out of Peter. Who knows who is the Messiah? Jesus. Jesus knows. Jesus knows that he is the Messiah. The question is, do they? The question is, are they willing to articulate that? The question is, are they going to be willing to take the... Oh, let's see, what's the word that I can use here to kind of pull this all together? The whole experience of Jesus and actually take that to the world. Are they going to be willing to actually die doing that very thing? And the only way that's going to happen is if, in fact, they truly believe who Jesus has demonstrated himself to be. Well, I think one of the things about the Messiah... Peter believed that Jesus was the Messiah, so did John the Baptist. But they didn't know he was going to die. <laughs> That's I true. Mean, are, right. It wasn't part of the picture. The Messiah was. Yeah. It's two different things. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I believe you're the Messiah, and soon you're going to set up your kingdom, and I'm going to be standing right next to you in riches and power. Yeah. But a Messiah that's going to die, and I am going to spend the next 30 or 40 years of my life suffering and carrying around the gospel and being persecuted and threatened to die and being put in jail? No, I, I have no concept at all that that's what you're talking about. Because of the conditioning, just as we all have our American conditioning here, because of the conditioning that everybody went through at that time, Jesus is setting them up for Pentecost that's when they're going to more fully understand. Is when the but before Pentecost, what happens? Well, <laughs> there was a certain amount of understanding. Before Pentecost, there is the cross. Oh, yeah. And that absolutely destroyed every one of the disciples. Peter thought he knew how he was going to act. He didn't know how right. he was going to act. Let's continue reading, verse 16, or chapter 16, verses 20, going through 23. Jesus gave orders, interesting. Jesus gave orders to his disciples to tell no one that he was God's anointed one. Interesting. He's had this discussion with them. He's drawn it out from them. They have, they, have a, they have taken a position that, in fact, Jesus is the Messiah. And then Jesus says, I don't know what you're talking about this. Yeah, take it back away from him. Well, Keep this quiet. Talking about it now. I, I understand that. I understand. But we're, we're in this conversation. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. And what? Yeah. And what? And be killed. Raised. And raised on the third day. Now, and then Peter. They didn't hear the kill. And they didn't hear the business about the, the being raised. On the, I mean, that was just not going to happen. It was so far out. So what now, did Peter do again? here we have Peter coming back into this dialogue. Peter caught hold of him, grabbed Jesus. I mean, I can see this taking place between, I mean, this is the way guys are. You know, they grab each other and they shove each other around. And I can see Peter grabbing Jesus by the shoulders and saying, Ain't happening. God forbid that this should happen to you. This must never come to you. Peter was what? Peter was a take charge guy. He was a man's man. And he was going to set Jesus straight. Don't talk like that. <laughs> that is not the way you talk yeah. as a leader. Who is going to be king? <clears throat> that idea has to be gotten out of your head. If yeah. it hadn't happened, they would have crashed after Jesus died yeah. and had given up the whole thing. And I think basically they did. I mean, they were, for all intents and purposes, they were, 
they were a bunch of uh, scared dogs running home. But they didn't totally. I mean, they still kind of stuck together. They what hung else together. could they do? What's that? What else could they do? There was nobody else. Everybody else yeah. was laughing at them because <clears throat> of what had happened to their Messiah. Yeah. I mean, you remember that uh, Pilate put a sign up on the cross. Yeah. This is your Messiah. Yeah. Yeah. It's mocking. Right. They were ridiculed, I'm sure. Jesus turned and said to Peter, so this is Peter now who has just within the, within the last few minutes has identified Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus now turns around and says to him, Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are putting a stumbling block in my way. Your ideas are not God's, but man's. So Satan is more than a name. Satan is more than a name. Keep sure. talking. Sure. If, if Jesus called Peter Satan, or is he trying to have an exorcism on the Satan that's in within Peter? I think what Satan is trying to do is to use Peter mm. to put pressure on Jesus mm. because friends have an impact mm -hmm. on you. In other words, if you're doing something and your friends all say, hey, it's wrong, don't do that, etc., this has a tremendous impact on you as a person who is identified with other people. And so what, Jesus, what Satan is trying to do is work through Peter to get Jesus to stumble. The lesson had a very interesting thought on this here, and it says this, and I have, I'm still pondering this. It says Peter's problem was not that he was trying to protect Jesus. Rather, his problem was he was trying to steer Jesus. He was no longer following Jesus. He was telling Jesus to follow him. Interesting. When was the last time you tried to steer God? Because I know better. <laughs> I know what the outcome should be. What was Peter's goal here? I mean, what was Peter's vision as to what Jesus was all about? Jesus was going to be what? A king. Is there anything wrong with that? <laughs> Not if you're here to be a sacrifice, though, or to save a human race. It doesn't work. <clears throat> oh, in Peterson. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, he is going to be the king, and I yeah. am going to support him yeah. and help him get to that throne. Yeah. We all, as friends, want yeah. to be that person yeah. helping somebody achieve Succeed. their goals. Yeah. So while Peter was absolutely being manipulated by Satan here, I don't believe knew he was being manipulated by Satan. I don't think he was aware of that, mm -hmm. but Christ is making him aware of that yeah. because he is, it's the disciples who are going to carry on the yeah. church yeah. here very quickly. Yeah. George? It's so easy to ask for forgiveness, but can you imagine if God spoke directly to you and called you Satan? Uh, what a what a shock. Disconcerting, yeah. wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. And, and yet we often act the same way as Peter. Let me ask you a question. Oh, I'm sorry. But just come back to you, the point that Christ, uh, uh, Peter. Peter was basically trying, not consciously, but was usurping Mm, mm, and mm. you asked a question, you know, have you ever done that or how long since you've done that or something? Well, that is exactly what we do every time we disobey. Every time oh, yeah, we true. sin, yeah, sure. that is exactly what yeah. we do. My way. We, yeah, we say, you know, I know better than you. Right. And that's yeah. what Peter said. I know better than that. You know, no, that's not the way we want it to go. 
And I think they, uh, they lose light of the fact of who Jesus is in spite of the fact that they had just said, <laughs> you're the son of God. Yeah. They had been so in close contact with Jesus that they looked at him like just a man. Yeah. Uh, he's just one of us, one of the guys, and we're all heading towards some goal where he's gonna be the leader and we're going to be supporting cabinet. But the truth of the matter is they had lost sight of, you're talking to God here. Yeah. I mean, the guy you're grabbing hold of, please. That is God you're grabbing hold yeah. of. I mean, I would imagine... Who came to be later, the Lamb of Peter God. Thought, Boy, you know, I had the, the audacity to yeah. actually grab God by the clothes and try to tell him something. Whoa, that was foolish on my part. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. You know, the other thing to keep in mind here is what is really happening here? We are seeing the great controversy at play. Yes. Right here. We have Satan and we have Jesus in direct contact. Well, I think another interesting point here is in Peter's mind, he, he was correct. He knew what he believed mm -hmm. and, and he was being tested. And he wasn't going to fail that test. Oh, no, this is not going to happen to you. We're here to make sure that that's not going to happen to you in that test. But in reality, he had no clue what the Son of God really meant. Yeah, exactly. You know, so this is just Christ taking the step to bring him along um, to carry on the church. Yeah. You know, they need to be prepared. But... We saw the same. We saw the same thing in Gethsemane, uh, or when they came to take yeah. Jesus. He was right there with the sword. Well, you know, I think one thing that's interesting here is, is that on the one hand, you have the disciples who have seen and experienced this long list of amazing things. And those things convince Peter to say, you are the Messiah. And within that very context Jesus now then it says here and it doesn't give us the details as to what he says but it's, he gives us enough information Matthew does <clears throat> that from that time Jesus began to show his disciples he's going to go to Jerusalem he's going to suffer many things and he's going to be killed well one thing though it doesn't stop there because it says that only a week later Jesus takes them up on a mountain so that they can actually see who he really is and right. what he is right. going to achieve in the end. In the end. But in between him being crowned and so forth, and I would imagine that during the week that Jesus, I mean the weekend that Jesus was dead, they talked about this. Sure. Well, you remember right after he said he was going to die, then we went up on the mountain and there he actually shone like the sun, and Moses and Elijah was there. And I don't think they remembered any of that that weekend. Transfigured. I don't think they remembered any of that that weekend. Well, they had, what, 48 hours to talk about what went on. <laughs> they were talking. They were crying. They were in shock. They were in pain. They were not talking and talking, you know, pulling out their iPhones and going through their notes. No. Mm. Oh, I bet they were talking. <laughs> All right. My wife says they were talking, they were talking. <laughs> okay, the point is this. I said I bet they were. Okay. <laughs> okay, the point is this. What is, is, are we any different than Peter? Okay, what must we do? Exactly, we must be willing to, to recognize who Jesus is and be willing to, if you will, hook our wagon to him. Okay, that's what Peter was doing. He was, he was publicly taking a stand and saying, I know who you are. You are Jesus Christ. But it's so much easier for us to see this. Why, why do we have so much difficulty? Yes, I, we, it, it, it is easier, but it's more difficult. Well, okay. you let something bad happen in your life that yeah. you were not expecting and see how quickly your faith in God is shaken. Yeah. What thoughts go through your head about why this happened? 
and I've tried to live a good life, and I've been a Christian person, and then for this to happen to me, and so forth, I mean, all these kind of thoughts, they go through your head so thick and fast, and you cannot even stop it. Yeah. Amen. And we also have a better idea as to how things should be done, just like Peter did in relationship to Jesus, yes. Okay. So he was not looking at the situation. He was not looking at circumstances. He was not looking at events. He was not looking at the scripture the way Christ was. And that is where our failure will also come. If we do not spend the enough time with God and submitting our thinking to his thinking, Trusting, learning to trust him. Well, yes, but we become like a person when we spend time with him. Mm -hmm. And as we read scripture, asking for the Holy Spirit to give us the mind of Christ, help us to see the principles, see the application in our own life, and to uh, not implicate, um, implicate, implement that into our own perspective, our own way of thinking, that is the only way we are protected. One thing, probably all of the disciples joined in with Peter as soon as he said that and said, hey man, that's not going to happen. And you can imagine what Judas thought. <laughs> wow. I like her statement because I think we have natural reactions to things <clears throat> that happen to us. Somebody Fight or flight. Somebody cheats <laughs> us and, well, psh, we are not going to let that happen to us again. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And we have these firm statements that we make. And when, when somebody wants to go against those statements, you know, it's hard. A, a, a woman cheats on her husband and everybody stands behind him and says, you know, you got to leave her. She's just going to do that again. You got to leave her and do it again. And he chooses to forgive her. And and put his family together, and yet again she does it. And now people are just calling you stupid. You're just flat out stupid for doing this. You know, you're being walked over and walked. Stand up and be a man. But you know, is he seeing something there that that is different? Is he letting God lead him in a way that's different? We need to be careful in our judgment. <coughs> what, we, what advice we offer other Christians when they want to be so forgiven. We tend to say, you're going to get walked on. You're just going to get hurt again. Don't let that stuff. It's, it's Satan. And this yeah. lesson has really brought that home to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We need to be careful. So in closing, I would like to just uh, go back again to this issue with Peter. <clears throat> Peter's problem was not that he was trying to protect Jesus. It was not that he was unwilling to do what Jesus wanted him to do. He was trying to steer Jesus. He was no longer following Jesus. He was telling Jesus to follow him. And that, to me, is, I think, a big issue that all of us have to deal with. True faith isn't supposed to be the exciting experience of pursuing what you most want. True faith is the painful experience <clears throat> of releasing what you most want. When you let go of your dreams, you are losing your life. And at the same time, you are finding it. Mm. And I believe that Peter found his dream as he submitted to Jesus to a level that he never would have imagined. So he let his dream go to take God's dream for him. For him. Yes, Igneen. That's a hard thing. This all begins, this all begins, I believe, with the answer to the question. So what do you say, or who do you say mm -hmm. that I am? And depending upon how you answer that question, you go down one of two paths. And we know the path that Peter took. We also know the path that Judas took. And they went in opposite directions.
Let's stand and let's have prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, forgive us for when we have not been willing to follow. Forgive us for when we have wanted to lead, be in charge, set the direction, set the pace, set the course. Help us to be willing to step back and to let you be our God and Savior. Please bless us now as we continue to worship you this Sabbath. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I, for, for 35 years, I worked with State Farm Insurance Company, who was in big trouble for steering their customers to preferred body shops. <laughs> okay.